I'm about to say something now that could horrify some people. It wouldn't be the first time, but it's never my intention to horrify people um, or, 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 or do that. But sometimes some of us need to be a little bit provoked, a little bit, think a little bit more along the lines of Scripture in its context. Think about Scripture, not just things we've just heard for years and years and years. When there's, there's a shift coming and we need to be seeing things through a new paradigm of the kingdom of God that never, ever contradicts the Word of God. So let me say it, but please don't misunderstand me because I've just spent hours ago, I've been preaching now for I think nearly five hours, but I spent nearly five hours ago, spent a whole hour talking on the power of the blood and the power of forgiveness. So you can't misunderstand me now. Okay, so I'm going to make this statement. Here it goes. Take a deep breath. The primary purpose of the cross was not to provide forgiveness. The primary purpose of the cross was to cover His church in glory. The primary purpose of the cross was to cover His church in glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8 says, For the secret wisdom of God has been kept hidden for ages past that was destined for our glory before time began. And had the rulers of this world, that's the principalities and powers that stirred up Herod and Pontius Pilate to have Jesus crucified, had the rulers of this world known, known what? If they had known the secret wisdom of the cross, they, it says they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. So God ambushed the principalities and powers and authorities through the secret wisdom of the cross, which says in that verse, the cross was God's secret wisdom destined for our glory before time began. So Adam had the glory of God, but man sinned and fell short of the glory. And so Jesus came as last Adam, and he walked in the glory. Actually, Jesus did things in the anointing, but when those crowds were being healed en masse, that was the glory of God radiating. The quantum physics of the glory, when Jesus turned water into wine, you cannot do that in the anointing. That's the glory. You don't raise the dead with the anointing. You raise them in the glory. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it said, I'll show forth my glory. When he changed water into wine, he did it in the glory. There are things that you cannot do in the anointing. They happen in the quantum physics of the realms of the glory. So, of course, the cross provided forgiveness. But it's because man had sinned and fallen short of the glory. So God is restoring mankind in Christ to the realms of glory that are higher estate than Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. God is revealing and manifesting His glory in the earth today and is going to keep on increasing. So, he has a statement I believe is paramountly self-evident. So yeah, let me say it. The church cannot go further than the level of glory that they are exposed to. I'm going to say that again. Believers and the church cannot go further than the levels of the glory that they are exposed to. Let me explain that. Moses was up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights covered in glory. His whole face was shining. That's the Shekinah glory. He had the Kabod glory, the Shekinah glory, and the Doxa glory. He was there in that realm of glory for 40 days. I mean, the more you press into the glory, the more the glory presses into you. I mean, even under an old covenant, when they were in the glory, the shoes didn't wear out, the clothes didn't wear out. God had to tell Moses to die eventually. There's something about the glory that renews you, strengthens you. There's something in the glory that brings you rest. He was in the glory for 40 days and 40 nights. Israel, on the other hand, was at the bottom of the mountain. They had not been in the glory at all. Because God wanted all of Israel to come up the mountain into His glory. But they didn't like that. They were afraid. They didn't want to be a priesthood. They wanted someone else to be a priest for them. God wanted them all to be priests. Every believer in Christ has been called into the glory for supernatural life supernatural ministry, to be able to handle being put in prison like Paul and Silas and worship God until the glory comes and shakes the prison. Or if he doesn't shake the prison and open the doors, then he'll shake some people's hearts or whatever. And then if you have to die, then you die in the glory. But whatever, we will not surrender to the spirit of this corrupted age, but we are living with another age. We are citizens of heaven. So Israel stayed out of the glory for 40 days and 40 nights. 
And that's very dangerous to be not exposed to the glory for 40 days and 40 nights. So when Moses comes down from 40 days in the glory and 40 nights, what Israel is doing, they have taken their clothes off, they're running around, they are committing immorality, and they've made a golden calf, and they're worshiping idols. Why? Because the church cannot go beyond the realms of the glory that we're exposed to. When the church lives outside of the glory, the unbelieving world around us converts us to their values and their immorality and philosophies and idols. But whenever the church lives in the glory, the church converts the world around to God's eternal values. I want to say that again. The church that lives outside of the glory will be converted to the world's values. And this is no condemnation now. There's no, this is, this is liberating. It's helping people to understand what's going on. In the United States, the divorce rate for Christians is the same as for unbelievers. Now again, early on I talked about divorce without any condemnation. So as we, as we look at Christians' calendars, their diaries, their priorities, their prayer life, what, it, what they're doing, it doesn't differ that much from unbelievers. If, if, a, if a Christian is going through financial problems, they often will just do what unbelievers do. They'll go borrow money. They'll do anything. They are behaving and conforming to the pattern of this world because you cannot be transformed without that glory is changing you from degree of glory to the next degree of glory. So I want to say it again. Please hear it with love. When the church lives outside of the glory, the unbelieving world around us converts us to their culture, their values, their idols, their immorality, their philosophies, and their priorities, and their superstars, and their celebrities, and all of their passions. But whenever the church lives in the glory, the church converts the people around us, society around us, to God's eternal value. When the first century church lived in this realm of glory, it shook cities. Revival broke out. People were cut to the heart. Nations were impacted. What's coming now in 219 is greater than anything that's ever been seen on the planet before. And God has waited for this time. It's not just for one place. It's, you won't hear of just revival in one place. You won't have to travel to one place. It's going to break out across the world wherever people are awake and aware and listening to heaven and they are interpreting the news and the papers and what people are saying with the eyes of wisdom, with the eyes of the anointing, with the eyes of the glory. The glory will convert the most hardened people in moments. There was a man who was so angry, he was so aggressive, he hated the church, he was killing Christians, he was arresting Christians, he was so passionate, he was so religious, he was so zealous. He says that he was even a murderer and a liar, he writes to Timothy, before he was a believer. And on the Damascus road, this hardened Pharisee, a light suddenly appears. What is that light? Rise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord. The glory of God just manifested to Saul, so that... In Israel, which is the light, I've been in Israel, and the light there is so bright, the noonday sun is so bright, said it was at noonday, and he said it saw a bright light. Friend, to see a bright light in Israel means that light is, 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 is a heavenly supernatural light. That's the glory, that's the Shekinah, and the Kabod, and the Doxa came, and saw fell, and he was overwhelmed, and he heard a voice, because it's so easy to hear a voice, and he said, who are you? Lord, so he knew this was the Lord God Almighty. And the voice came back and said, I am Jesus. And then Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, in the glory, Jesus said to this hardened man, why do you kick against the pricks? Or why do you persecute me? Which is a tremendous revelation that when you hurt the true believers of Christ, you are touching Christ himself. And Christ appeared to Paul, Saul, and manifested his glory. And Paul was unconscious. He was on the ground. He was actually blind for three days. Like scales came over his eyes. And Paul saw more with his eyes blinded than people with their eyes open. In that time, God spoke to Paul. God changed his name. He hit Paul so hard, he hit the S of his name and put a P in front of his name. But in that time, Paul heard the word of God come, call him, tell him he's going to be persecuted, called him. He's going to, the, he said, your people, which is the Jews, are going to persecute you. He warned Paul about it. That's a lovely prophecy. Hey, get ready. Your own people are going to persecute you. He said, you're going to go mainly from the gen to the Gentiles and you're going to turn people from the power of Satan and you're going to open their eyes and bring them out of darkness 
so that they can receive forgiveness of sins and have their place amongst those sanctified by faith. Now, friends, that's Jesus speaking from the glory to Paul. And you've got people today who are universalists or inclusivists that say everyone is automatically saved. The day they're born, they're already born into salvation. Now, friends, Jesus appears to Saul, gets him saved in an encounter in the glory, changes his hard heart, opens the revelation of grace to him, tells him that the people that are not saved are under the power of Satan. That's the exact phrase of Jesus. You're going you're to deliver people from the power of Satan, f- turn them out of darkness, open their eyes, and bring them into light so, they can, so that they can receive forgiveness of sins, which means they did not have forgiveness of sins until they repent. They were under the power of Satan, under darkness, and, uh, and, and deceived. And they were, they were under the power of a hostile, evil being called the devil. And Paul is going to, in the power of God, bring people out of that darkness, open their eyes so they could receive forgiveness of sin. Friends, this idea of taking your four spiritual laws and knocking on someone's door and you know, just trying to tell them intellectually how to get saved, that is not the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is not by words only. It is in a demonstration of power. And every time in the world I've seen the power of God move, people just flock to get saved because of the demonstration of God's power. So the glory changed the heart of a very hardened religious fanatic who was a murderer and a hater of God's people. But he got saved. He got born again. He encountered the realms of the glory. The moment he got, he got saved in the glory and he eventually got caught up in the third heaven and had all kinds of revelation and went through so much hardship, so much persecution, so much rejection. And yet he just says, he just stays faithful all through his life because he has this encounter in the glory. I'm watching people who say they're Christians. They never experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They don't hardly know a thing about the blood. They hardly know anything about Jesus as our Redeemer, that the sacrifice was greater than the judgment. They just got some laws and Christian principles, and they go to church, but they're spiritually dead. They lost. They have no clue about the heavens, about the glory, about the anointing. Friends, that is going to change in this earth. God is separating things in his, in his glory. He is going to expose fraudulent, counterfeit religion, and he's going to reveal his glorious house. He's going to shake everything, and the only stable, safe place on this planet is going to be where the glory is. People are going to flock to where there's stability, and that's the glory. The glory is the unshakable place.